Would you take God's word tonight, please, and open to the book of Romans, chapter 8. As you know, we've been uh, doing a brief study on um, the believer's war against sin, and we've been looking at Romans, chapter 8. And tonight we're going to look at verses 14 down to verse number 17. And I want to talk about tonight your adoption, adoption confirmed. Romans chapter 8, look in verse number 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And I think that this is one of the most beautiful verses, or passages, I should say, in the New Testament that deals with the, the believer's adoption and their relationship to the Father. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul uses a lot of illustrations and, and metaphors to to communicate spiritual truth. Actually, two, two, new, two New Testament writers, I think, uh, do that a lot. One is uh, James. If you ever read the epistle of James, it's filled with metaphors that uh, illustrate spiritual truth. And the Apostle Paul certainly does that as well. He uses uh, metaphors from the athletic realm. He talks about running and wrestling and team sports and from the military world, from the farming world, from just every other kind of aspect of culture and society. But in order to communicate the Spirit's work in our life and the operation of the Spirit of God in the believer, Paul is now going to use the metaphor of adoption here. So let's think about adoption because that's the theme of these verses here. What is adoption? Well, um, adoption is an act, and we're talking about the spiritual adoption as you as a child of God. It's an act of God's free grace whereby we are received into the family of God, and because of that, we have a right to all the privileges uh, that, uh, that uh, are part of being sons and daughters of God. And of course, that's just like a, on an earthly adoption, when a family adopts a child, they're legally, that child now is part of that family and has all of the privileges and the status of a child in that family. Now, the Greek word translated adoption here is uh, huothesia, and it occurs five times in the New Testament, um, and it means to the place and condition of a son given to one to whom it does not naturally belong. Uh, the Loanida Greek lexicon says, to formally and legally declare that someone who is not one's own child is henceforth to be treated and cared for as one's own child including the complete rights of inheritance. And so literally the word actually means to place as a son. And this is a technical term that was used back in that day to speak of the whole legal process of adoption. Now, I think that when Paul talks about adoption, I think he's, uh, of course, remember he's writing to uh, uh, Romans and, and people in that d- world. So when he uses this word here, they understand fully what Paul's talking about uh, this, this whole Roman custom. And I think when Paul talks about adoption, he's referring to the Roman custom back in that time, but I think he also kind of mixes in some of the Old Testament uh, and what the Old Testament says about adoption. But, and so I think that Paul here wants us to understand this from that aspect. So let's think about the, me- the method of adoption, the Roman custom. In Roman culture, sometimes an adult son, uh, an adult son might want to exchange, and the, the legal term for that, that the, the Latin term is uh, patria potestis, that is, the, the father's authority. He might want to exchange his father's authority for the authority of another, another potesta, another authority. There might be many reasons for this, maybe to, pre- to preserve a family name, property. Uh, maybe there's no male successor to this one family, or it might just be the that here's a slave that's gained the favor of a man. There are many reasons for adoption, but whatever the reason, it was a very serious undertaking in that culture. There were actually two, st- two steps involved in this. First of all, there was called um, 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 
man, 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 mancipatio, excuse me. Let me get the, the, the Latin term there right. Mancipatio. And this was the release of one, uh, of the one to be adopted from his natural father. Now, normally there were three people involved there that had to be there. First of all, there had to be the natural father at this court proceeding. There had to be the adopting father. And then there had to be a witness, an intermediary, that bore witness to what was happening there. The natural father sold his son um, three times to the adopting father. The adopting father then became his new potesta, his new authority, the father authority in his life. The old father's authority was broken, and the new father's authority was established. And that was the second step in this Roman custom, which is vindicatio, and this is where the adopting father asserts his, his potesta, his authority over the adopting son. Uh, the adopting father laid claim to the adopted son before the judge. Now, if there were no one there to, to, uh, to protest this, um, and uh, then it was legally declared then that the new adopting father was the legal father, and there was a witness there to bear witness of this whole proceeding. The, the, for the adopted son, this, he was legally, uh, you, you could say it was legally a new birth. A new life had begun. The old life was behind. All rights in the old family were gone. All rights in the new family were gained. The adopted son was, was the heir of his new father's estate. If there were any other sons in that family, he was treated just like all the other natural sons. All the debts from his old life were completely canceled. He was now debt-free. No claim could be made against him in the courts on that account. And so in the eyes of the law, he was no longer the person he had been. He was now a brand new person with a brand new name and a new status with a new potesta, a new authority in his life. And that's what Paul's referring to here when he uses this word. He's drawing heavily upon the Roman custom to illustrate the believer's position in Christ. Now, all of what I just described to you in that Roman custom, there are parallels for the believer. There was a time when we were under the old potesta, the authority of sin. Um, You will remember in the previous chapters, Paul argued this. In Romans 3, 9, Paul said, we are that we are all under sin. Um, But God, in his mercy, made us his children through adoption. He bought us. How did he buy us? Of course, through the redemption of Jesus Christ. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Therefore, our old father, or we could say sin, has no more claim or authority over us. And we looked at that in Romans chapter 6, and we were talking about this issue. The old potesta, the old authority, has been broken in our life. Therefore, we have no more obligation or debts to the past life. The Bible says in Romans 8, 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. All of our old obligations have been canceled. All of our old debts have been canceled. Our new life has begun. On the other hand, our adoptive father now has a new claim on our life. He's our new authority. Uh, He has absolute authority in our life. We have been given his name, and we now belong to him. Now, one thing about this, just as in the Roman custom, there was an uh, intermediary or there was a witness to confirm the adoption Even so, as children of God, we have a witness who confirms our new status as adopted children of God. Now, you might ask, well, who is that witness that confirms to us that we are now adopted children of God? I'm glad you asked. That witness is the Holy Spirit of God. And this is Paul's whole point here in Romans chapter 8. Remember, in Romans 8, Paul is teaching us about life in the Spirit. Um. We find the theme of Romans 8 in verse 1, there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Paul began this chapter with that thought. He ends it with that thought as well in verse number 34. 
We will not have to be punished for our sins because Christ has already paid the penalty. And as I said before, this whole chapter illustrates our no condemnation status in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a discourse really on the believer's security. That's why it ends with there's no separation. Uh, Nothing can separate us from the love of God. But also Romans chapter 8 teaches us the wonderful ministry of the Holy Spirit, all of what the Holy Spirit does in the life of the believer. He frees us from the law of sin and death. He enables us to fulfill the will of God because now he's living inside of us and he's empowering us to do that very thing. He changes our nature. He changes our mindset. We no longer have a carnal mindset. We now have the mind of the Spirit. We mind the things of the Spirit. And we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to have victory in our life. And this is another work that the Holy Spirit does. He confirms your adoption. He confirms that you are a child of God. Now, this passage reveals to us three factors that the Spirit of God uses to confirm our adoption as children of God. Three things that the Holy Spirit will do in our life to confirm that to us. Look in verse number 14 again. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, the first time the concept sons of God is used uh, in Romans is right here with with respect to salvation. The old liberalism, that argument of old liberalism is the idea, you know, you probably heard this of the, of the, um, the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. And that's a really warm sentiment that's a part of liberal theology that says, you know, Uh, God is the Father for all of us, and we are all together brothers and sisters in this world. That's a warm thought. The only problem is it's not true. It's not biblical. Not everyone can call God Father. Only those who have been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, only those who have been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ and adopted into the family of God can call God Father. You're the only ones who have the privilege of doing that. And one telltale sign of being a child of God is the fact that you will experience in your life the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, the question comes then, how does the Holy Spirit lead us? You say that if you're a child of God, you will experience the leading of the Holy Spirit. Well, how does all that happen? How does the Holy Spirit of God lead us? People have a lot of different ideas on this, most of which I've read are not biblical, this is not talking about an outward leading. Uh, it's, not, it's not providence. We, we rejoice over the outward providences of God that we see in our life, but that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's not talking about providences. He's not talking about circumstances. He's not talking about people or counsel or any of those things. But this is an internal leading. Paul is talking about something that is not objective, but he's talking about something that is subjective in our life. There will be an an internal leading of the Spirit of God if you are a true child of God. So what does God do? What does he do? What does the Spirit do? Here's the first thing. When the Spirit sanctifies the mind, he'll sanctify your mind. The Holy Spirit works on the intellect. Paul calls this in Romans 12 too, the renewing of the mind. We, We looked at this verse in Sunday school this morning. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This person who discovers, tests, and approves what is God's will, that it's good, acceptable, and pleasing, is a person who is being led by God. It is the work of the Holy Spirit in that person's life. And the key to this, then, is the renewing of your mind. This is how the Spirit leads us, is through the renewing of our mind. Now, how does the Spirit renew our mind? There's only one way he does that. It's through revealing to us the truth of God's Word. He reveals to us the truth of Scripture. He gives us understanding into spiritual truth in the Word of God. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever been in a study or maybe hearing a sermon, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just illuminates your mind, where that you understand something now, perhaps that you didn't grasp it before. 
I heard about the young preacher who got up to pray. He was very nervous, and he prayed. He said, Holy Spirit, eliminate our minds. He got that wrong. The Holy Spirit doesn't eliminate your mind, okay? He illuminates your mind. That's the right word there. And he will teach you truth. I, I, I can just give you the outward evidences and teaching, but it's the Holy Spirit who has to remove the veil, who gives you truth in your mind. He directs our path uh, by opening our mind to understand the truth of the Word of God, giving us an understanding, and he redirects our thinking. Perhaps you thought about something in a different way, but now because of the truth of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit revealing that truth to you, what he will do then is he will lead you in a different direction, in a different way. The the way you thought about something before, you don't think about it that way anymore because the Holy Spirit is leading you. He's redirected you. Um, And that's all part of what the Holy Spirit of God does through the Word of God. We receive God's wisdom through His Word and the Spirit of God illuminating our minds. Paul said this in in Ephesians 1, 15, After I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. That is all the leading of the Holy Spirit, that he enlightens you, that he opens up the eyes of your understanding. That is being led by the Spirit of God there. And so the Spirit will open our minds. He'll fill us with the knowledge of God's will, That's why we are to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. And Paul talked about this in 1 Corinthians 1-2 when he said, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. That's why some people, when they come to church and they hear the Word of God, they're not even close to being interested in that. Why? Because it's like reading somebody else's mail. They don't get it. They're, they're, they have never been born again, and the Holy Spirit has never entered into them and has worked on the inside to give them understanding and give them spiritual discernment to know what Scripture says. And I want to tell you, friend, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not getting it. He's the one that does the work of giving you the truth of God's Word and giving us the mind of Christ. And so... Has the Holy Spirit been leading you? Have you experienced that enlightening in your mind from the study of Scripture? Have you discovered things about God from the Word of God? Have you discovered things about yourself? Has the Holy Spirit changed your thinking on things? That's how He leads you. But there's a second thing that the Spirit of God does. Not only does He sanctify the mind, but secondly, the Spirit of God stirs the heart. He'll stir the heart. This is the seed of our emotions and affections. He will stir up our affections for spiritual things. When we learn spiritual truths, the Spirit then stirs our heart to what we know. Has that ever happened to you when you hear truth from the Word of God? I know there are some services that are all designed to get people to feel a certain thing. You know, it's all arranged to, to get you hyped up and to get you all emotional And again, there's nothing wrong with emotions. God gave us all emotions. But a lot of times, you know, you go to church services like that, and you're all hyped up, and then you leave, and then you're no longer hyped up, and then you wonder, what was I hyped up about? Because there was no real spiritual truth that was given in that time. And see, what God does is he, first of all, the Holy Spirit will enlighten our mind. He'll reveal to us truth about Jesus and about God through the Scripture. And then he will stir our affections about that very thing. And then we'll have um, great emotion about the truth that we hear. Friend, I, there, there, are certain, there are certain things when I hear preached about Jesus and God, I can't help but get emotional when I hear that. But it's because of who Jesus is. It's because of who God is and what God has done. It's because the truth that the Holy Spirit uses to stir our heart. It's like the disciples on the road to Emmaus said to one another in Luke 24, 32, and they said to one, to one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way 
And while he opened to us the Scriptures, and, and, and again, that's what God does. He will cause our heart to burn. In Psalm 104, verse 34, the psalmist said, My meditation of him shall be sweet, and I will be glad in the Lord. And Jeremiah 15, Jeremiah said, 15, 16, Thy words were found, I did eat them. Thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. When Jeremiah read God's word, he understood what God was saying. It stirred his affections. And again, that's what God does. He will stir our affections. But then another thing that God will do, the Spirit will do, is the Spirit strengthens the will. He will strengthen the will. So the Spirit of God will, first of all, sanctify the mind, he'll stir the heart, and then he'll strengthen our will. That's all part of the leading of the Spirit of God. Um, the truth will get a hold of us. And, and now it'll redirect our paths. It'll redirect what we do. And that is following the leading of the Spirit. In Philippians 2.12, it says this, Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then he says this, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 13. God works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. God gives us a singleness of purpose then to do his will. Has God ever redirected your will in that way? To give you a a commitment to do something that God has revealed to you. When you look deep inside of your own heart, is there a commitment to do His will? John Murray said this, the activity of the believer is the evidence of the Spirit's activity, and the activity of the Spirit is the cause of the believer's activity. And that's exactly right. That's the believer's spiritual instruction. If you are a child of God, you will be led by the Spirit of God. He will do all these things. Sanctify your mind, stir your affection, strengthen your resolve and your will to do what God says. That is the leading of the Spirit of God in your life. But here's the second thing that we see. The believer's spiritual intimacy. Look at verse 15. For if you not receive the spirit of bondage, again, to fear... But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Another means of confirming our adoption is the spirit. What he does is he, he takes away our fear of punishment for our sin. And then he gives us the spirit of adoption. So he will remove the fear of punishment. And he teaches us to cry out, Abba, Father. Um, you know, before you became a Christian, you were in bondage to sin as we know. Hebrews 12, 15 says that Christ came to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Men lived under the guilt of sin, under the fear of judgment, the fear of God's punishment. The unredeemed feel this sense of bondage. They don't have that relief from all of that that salvation provides. They might hide it. They might say, oh, I don't believe that. But deep down, they know that there's going to be a judgment because God has placed that innate knowledge in, in the unbeliever. They might try to suppress it. They might try to push it away. But there is this foreboding in them of judgment, of punishment because of their sin. They might try to forget it. Uh, they might try to use man-made religions to cover it. But by doing those very things, all they're doing is affirming that fear that they have. In the, in, the, in the conscience of the man, the Bible says, the law of God worketh wrath. That's uh, Romans 4.15. And you didn't become a Christian to receive the spirit of bondage, Paul says. Uh, you know, you didn't become a Christian to receive all of that, okay? The spirit of God, what happens when you get saved is you are released from all of that fear. You're released from all of that sense of judgment, that sense of doom. Why? Because you know that now Christ has taken the wrath of God on the cross for you, and the Holy Spirit of God releases you from that fear of punishment. And he, on the other hand, what he does is he now confirms that you're a child of God because in place of this sense of foreboding that you had in your heart, now what do you have? You have the Holy Spirit, who teaches you to cry out, Abba, Father. Abba was the most intimate word used back then. 
Um, remember, I, as I said this morning, God's love is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. And now you have that Spirit living within you, and now you have love for God, you have love for others. The Bible says God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That all comes with salvation. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear. And so therefore now we don't have this sense of foreboding. We, in fact, now we come to God. We run to God. Whereas before, you know, we didn't want to be around people that were godly. You know, a lot of people, they're afraid of coming to church. They're afraid of being talk about God because of that sense of fear. But now that you're a child of God, you have the spirit of adoption, and you cry out, Abba, Father. There's a beautiful illustration of this in the Old Testament with the story of David and Jonathan. They made a covenant together. Of course, later on, Jonathan was killed in battle. But Jonathan had a little son named Mephibosheth. And David, one day, many years later, after Jonathan is, was killed in battle, Remembered the covenant that he had with Jonathan. Sitting on his throne, he said one day, is there anyone in the house of Jonathan that I can show kindness to because of Jonathan's sake? Well, Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth, but you know where he was? He was hiding, the Bible says, in a place called Lodibar. You know why? Because he was afraid of David. He feared David. He thought that David wanted to kill him. That's what a new king would do. When a new dynasty took over, all the family of the old king was put to death. So he was living in fear. The Bible says he was a cripple, living in a poor place, living in fear. And one day, David sends for him and brings him to the palace. And the Bible talks about this whole story in in 2 Samuel chapter 4. um, And then in chapter 9, when he's brought before David, um, and he falls down in front of David. He's fear. He's afraid. He's trembling. And you know what David says to him? Don't be afraid, Mephibosheth you know what? You're going to eat bread at my table. You're going to be like one of the king's sons. You know, in essence, what David does is he adopts Mephibosheth into the family. And you know what? Whereas he had fear of who David was, perhaps he even hated David because he thought David wanted to kill him. Now, all of that is removed. The sense of fear and bondage is gone. And what is replaced is now he knows that he is like one of the king's sons. And and David says, you're going to eat bread at my table continually. All that you lost, I'm going to restore to you. I'm going to restore all of your father's inheritance. And uh, you're going to be one of my sons. That's a beautiful illustration of what happens to the child of God. We no longer have this bondage or fear over God. We now have a sense of love because we know that God Uh, has adopted us. He has given us the spirit of adoption whereby, again, we cry out, Abba, Father. Again, the Aramaic term means Papa or Daddy. It's used appropriately for only one person, that's your father. There's only one person that you would call that. And it's a term of of trust, of dependence, of tenderness. It's, it's, It's a term of love. It's a term of intimacy. We can go into God's presence and we can cry out, Abba, Father. That's what the Spirit of God does in our heart. But then he bears witness that we are the sons of God. Look at verse 16. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Again, this is the internal witness that our adoption is confirmed. And the Holy Spirit says to you inwardly, subjectively, you are a child of God. God. You, are, you belong to the Father. He is that witness. Remember I said in the Roman custom of adoption, there was always that intermediary. There was always that witness to that whole process. And that witness for us is the Holy Spirit. He is the direct witness, and he will tell us that we are a child of God. And again, this is an inward work. This is a subjective work of the Holy Spirit. And let me just say, beloved, we don't need to be afraid of subjective inward work that the Holy Spirit does. I know there's a lot of focus on the objective side of the Christian life. The question is, is there a a subjective side to the Christian life where the Spirit of God works inwardly? And I say, I see that in Scripture. Of course there is. We need to be careful with that, however. We need to make sure that our subjective experience is 
under the uh, authority and under and in harmony with the objective Word of God. But there is that subjective work of the Holy Spirit in our heart that gives us that peace that tells us that we belong to God. And then there's a third thing. The Spirit of God gives us instruction. There's the believer's instruction. There's the believer's spiritual intimacy. He reminds us that we are children of God. But there's a third work that the Holy Spirit of God does, and that is the believer's spiritual inheritance. Look at verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You know what the Holy Spirit does to us? Not only does he lead us, instruct us, remind us of that we're children, teaches us to cry out, and intimacy to God takes away that spirit of fear. But then he reminds us of our inheritance. He reminds us what a marvelous thing to be an heir of God. I heard about a man when the announcement was given many, many years ago, Rockefeller, the great millionaire. When Rockefeller died, um, there was a man who heard that news, and he sat down on the street corner, and he just began to cry. And one person came along and said, why are you crying? He said, haven't you heard the news Rockefeller died? He said, well, you're not related to Rockefeller. He said, that's why I'm crying. <laughs> you know, sometimes children hope for an inheritance that they might never get from our earthly parents. But you know what? It's different with God. God will give us our inheritance. You can rest assured that, that he will... He who owes us nothing will give us everything because we're heirs of God. We have an inheritance waiting for us. You understand that? You have an incredible inheritance. And what the Holy Spirit of God does is he points to this. He reminds us, look, you're an heir of God. You understand how much you have? Now, we have to think of this in terms of being victorious over sin. You know what causes sin to lose its power? when you understand how rich you are in Jesus Christ, when you understand everything that God has given to you, all the gifts, all the blessings, and when you meditate and are reminded about that, temptation loses its power. There is nothing that this world can give you that can be anywhere close to what God can give you. So why would we be tempted by the things of the world in this flesh when God gives us so much more in Christ? You are an heir of God. Listen to what Peter said, 1 Peter 3. Blessed be God, the Father, and the Father of our Lord Jesus, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. I love that. God is keeping the inheritance for you, and he's keeping you for it. You're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, what does this inheritance consist of? What is it? Well, let me just give you a few, few things I think that the Bible talks about. First of all, we have a heavenly home. What is that worth to you? That you have a mansion in heaven waiting for you? Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. It's personal. Jesus is in heaven preparing a place for us. That's part of your inheritance. You have a home in heaven, an eternal home. You know, another thing, a heavenly banquet. Um, in his parables, Jesus spoke of a heavenly banquet to which we're all invited, the great wedding supper, I believe, in heaven. We're going to have wonderful times of fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, going to, it's just going to be a wonderful time. You know, going back to the story of Mephibosheth, you know, can you imagine Mephibosheth? One day he's, he's, he's poor, he's crippled, he's in this place of poverty. The next day he's brought to the king's palace, given a, a home, a place, prepared for him there, and he sleeps on royal sheets. He wakes up the next morning, he comes down to the breakfast table, he pulls up to the table. The tablecloth covers his legs. You can't tell he's a cripple now. He looks like just like all the rest of the king's burly sons sitting at the table. And, and, and he's there 
and there's a meal there, and I imagine he's a little shy at first, and, uh, you know, suddenly, you know, he says, David, will you pass the biscuits, please? Will you pass the jelly? And David might reach out, and there's a scar on his wrist. You know why? Because he made a covenant with his father, Jonathan, many years ago. And when you did that, you normally cut your wrist, and then you would rub in some soot so that the scar would be there, reminded you that you were part of a covenant that you made with someone. And Jonathan, or excuse me, Mephibosheth sees that nasty scar. He says, King David, where'd you get that scar from? Well, I made a covenant many years ago with your father, Jonathan. I imagine one day we're going to get to heaven, and I'm going to be seated at the table, and I'm going to say, would you pass the biscuits, Jesus? Pass the jelly, and Jesus will reach out. And you know what I'll see? I'll see a scar there on his hands. The only man-made thing in heaven are the scars of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll remember that the reason I'm enjoying all of these blessings, the reason I have all of this inheritance is because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. Part of our inheritance will be that fellowship, that joy that we have in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, the heavenly banquet there in heaven. But then our rule with Christ, the Bible says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. We reign with the Lord Jesus Christ there in heaven. But I think another part of our inheritance is likeness to Christ. First John, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. And then he goes on to say, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. You know, part of our inheritance is the fact that we, our salvation will be complete. We will be totally glorified. Would you know what that means? No more sin nature. I won't have to wrestle against sin in my life. I'll finally be free from the presence and the power of sin. I'll be made just like Christ. That's part of your spiritual inheritance. And I'll tell you furthermore, God is our portion. God will be our portion. The psalmist said it like this in Psalm 73, verse 25, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God is our portion. That's part of our spiritual inheritance. And on we could go. This is just a little bit of what the Bible says about our inheritance, that wonderful inheritance. And it's the Holy Spirit that reminds us constantly of all these blessings that we have because we are adopted. It is the Holy Spirit who is the witness who says your adoption is complete it is confirmed. You are a child of God. You can cry out, Abba, Father. You don't have to fear judgment, and you have a lot waiting for you in heaven one day. And it's that work of the Holy Spirit, beloved, that should rob temptation of its power. When we meditate on that, it should cause us to love Christ all the more. But let's bow for prayer together tonight. And so, Father, we just lift our hearts with thanksgiving and praise and, and great joy as we look forward to all the blessings, Lord, you have laid up for us. And then, Lord, to think that even now we are your children, that you've declared us your children, that our sins are forgiven, that we don't have to fear punishment, we don't have to fear your judgment because that was taken by Jesus Christ on the cross, the judgment for sin. And that fear is replaced by a, an inward desire given to us by the Holy Spirit to cry out to you and say, Abba, Father, whenever I need you, all I have to do is cry out. And you're there. I, I can't think of anything more blessed than that, Father. How we thank you for all these things. And I pray that, Lord, as we meditate on these rich blessings, that the world will lose its pull over us, that temptation will 
weaken in our life, that sin will be broken. Thank you, Father, for all these blessings in Christ. And we pray in Jesus' wonderful, matchless name.